So today we're really glad to be welcoming Howard Silverblatt. He is the senior index analyst of the S&P Dow Jones indices. So a lot of us know that more commonly as the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. He has uh, decades of experience on Wall Street. And we're going to be talking today about what the data points to. What does his crystal ball tell us about 2024, always data-driven, because that's, of course, his expertise. So thank you for joining me, Howard. And what does your crystal ball say for 2024 for all those Main Street investors out there? Well... Two answers, obviously, as usual. One's historical. Uh, in a presidential year, the market typically goes up nicely. Typically not not always in the first quarter. And the last 20, 30 years around Super Tuesday, it goes down. But the year is good. A couple of reasons for that. Uh, the people in power uh, want the economy to be good. Because uh, while uh, the market's important, uh, politics is important, beliefs are important, Pocketbooks are a lot more important, especially when you're going uh, to vote. Uh, so typically, they make sure the government is good. And that's why a lot of the people on the street currently are looking for some kind of additional government expenditures if we get into trouble. And you already have a lot of expenditures coming this year. Uh, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, even COVID money is coming out. And the negotiations that are going on now, which we may get a partial shutdown, seems to have $100 billion in additional cuts, including for corporations um, uh, writing off all our research and development fully. That's right. first year as compared to amortize. That's going to be a biggie, especially on industrials and healthcare companies. Healthcare has been going up the last couple of days, partially on that, as well as extension of trial credit. But yes, the year is typically very good. Uh, we have not gone down in the second term of a re-election since 1940. <clears throat> That's a long time and a lot of stats. That said, yeah. that's yesterday. This is today and always, today is always different. There's always issues. Uh, we have a lot more volatility than historically we do. We have a lot more political actions and items happening at this point in time. Uh, not just the election itself, but you have two military situations, uh, wars, yep. if you will, at there. Uh, you have Congress not being able to agree, potential government shutdowns. They have the Fed that at least I think won't move until at least June and whether it moves earlier or not, how much uh, buy there. Uh, so right. looking at those items and consumer spending, okay? Yep. I don't think we will have a great year, but I am looking for a, a mid single digit return. If you went by historical numbers, we should have double digits. The reason I'm at variance on that <clears throat> is even though I think the government spending is gonna go on and potentially increase right. if we get into trouble, Consumers seem to have uh, backed off a little. Uh, they're still spending, but they're a lot more selective. That's hurt a lot of industries, uh, as well as on their margins are starting to come down. And going forward, even though the uh, projections, both top, uh, from the bottom up analysts and uh, economists and strategists uh, by, uh, top down, on the eight to 11% yeah. line, with the economists being a little bit more stingy, uh, about 8% on average, uh, I have a concern about how much of that is actually going to go and that it might pull back. There are actually a couple of houses uh, calling for declining earnings, uh, which really mm. hit the market because we, the market price today goes on future earnings. I knew, I know what you made yesterday. I have an idea of what you made in the fourth quarter. It's what are you making in six to nine months? Because that's what I'm paying for. And that's a, right. one of the items for the PE that we had discussed earlier. Uh, so yeah, and again, I mean, in some of these, some of these companies, I mean, if we talk about the Magnificent Seven, we're not talking about earning six months from now on the prices, right? We're talking about uh, three years talking, out, even. That, that that's correct, especially if you're starting to do an AI, uh, or some yeah, of the companies exactly. that will benefit from AI, which everyone's hoping that's the next step. Yes, you have AI, and we've seen the video, and everybody go up uh, nicely on there yeah. uh, but what about the manufacturing companies that could now streamline and improve their, their productivity yeah. and their margins or uh, service companies that could better situate where they're located all these items uh i, I will give a personal uh, note in there uh which i've spoken to on, on several people and they typically agree but we don't get out to say it that much is i don't think ai is here at all it's going to be a long time till a system can think and go ahead that they could use its nose, shall we say, to smell it. It does have repetitive learning. It learns from the items and the more you can put into right. it, the more can go. So I think we're at a, 
a very high repetitive learning situation, but I think AI, which is the general term we we'll, we'll use, is way off. And there's a lot of companies that can benefit from that repetitive learning, you know, about what to Absolutely. do and where to do things. And, and, and yeah. those are going to be in play a lot. Well, let's talk a little bit. So I just want to nail it down. So you're saying sing, uh, mid single digits. So maybe five, 6% is what you're anticipating. Right. Four, four to 6% now, on there for, for 2024. Yeah. Plus dividends, okay. which should add another okay, so that's, and a half. Okay, good, good, good. Now, one of the things that you pointed out when you sent over some data is that we're getting to interest at 16% of revenue. So what kind of action should or will be taken in that scenario? What, how is that going to factor in? Uh, the 16% 6, is the U.S. federal debt amount. Uh, we are, we Typically, when you hit your... Interest is 14% of the revenue you're getting, you know, from taxes. You have to take action, okay? It is now, no action has been taken, and I wouldn't want to put any money against any odds that it's going to be taken. So we are now sitting at 16%. Think of having your charge card, and 16% of your income is going to pay off the interest, only the interest on that, to get that yeah. principal or anything else. That is eating into all your other money. Uh, add to that that the government is still deficit spending. We just had the 2023 um, deficit uh, was finalized, 2.1 trillion. 2.1 trillion you were spending more than you made, which is a 50 percent from last year. Okay, 1.4 trillion. I think 3.13 trillion was record in 2020. Uh, COVID inspired, of course, and the December numbers have already come in, and that was a 42 percent. So. We are spending a lot more. That is a problem. Adding to that is the government's policy, and we'll get more at the end of January, and we know what the Fed, uh, the Treasury, excuse me, is going to be uh, looking for going forward. They are borrowing more short-term than long-term. That has helped mm. the 10-year Treasuries, obviously. We're, you know, we're down to the 4.05% from over 5% in September. It's also yeah. helped, obviously, mortgage rates. But short term, I could still get 5.3, 5.4 on a treasury bill. Okay. Uh, yeah. I've got to think if I can get 5.3% short term, maybe go out to a year, get get over 5%. Do I want that market? If, if you had my comments, I think we're going to do 5, 6%, another percent and a half in dividends. I can test the market at getting a potential 7%, or I can sleep all night and get 5% in a treasury. Uh, right. So, so this this is definitely going. This is one of the reasons that we have almost five trillion dollars in money markets out there that we're hoping goes back to the market. You know, and we've seen some of it uh, at the beginning of January going in. Right. But definitely that cost of of of, of the debt, which is now over thirty four trillion dollars, okay, uh, is going to have an impact, and we're seeing it. it just again, it's similarities to the charge card. It's eating into your other income and with deficit spending still. Now, let's also talk about um, some of the, you know, we didn't talk enough about, I think, the consumer and maybe even the bank sectors, because I kind of want to drill in a little bit more. You and I have been talking about the the really spectacular gains of last year. And of course, we saw spectacular gains in 2021. But last year, it was Magnificent Seven. And will you tell us how much of the S&P gains really was driven by the Magnificent Seven? And then let's talk about the industries, both that one, I mean, that one, which is kind of um, got three industries within it, and other industries that are actually of great concern. Okay, we had a 26% total return last year in the S&P 500. <clears throat> Take out <clears throat> excuse me, the Magnificent Seven, which is really eight issues because uh, Google Alphabet has two classes of stock in there. So it's seven companies accounted for 62% of your return. Without those, your return is 9.9. .9. A decent return, but it's not 26 that you're bragging about. Uh, yeah. And this is because those issues have grown so much uh, where, and, and investors have put so much into it. Uh, again, we, we spoke in the video up about 340% for the whole time. I mean, that's an amazing number on there. Uh, but Tesla is still coming back. It did great last year, but it's still down from where it was two years ago. But the exactly. Magnificent Seven 
definitely has added to it, it made a difference when you look at equal weighted where everybody is the same as compared to the magnificent seven. I mean, these issues are close to 30, the top 10 in the 500 is close to 30%. Uh, it's happened before, but it's unusual. You've got to go back to like the eighties when a company called was that one? IBM was supposed to take over the world. Something about uh, personal computers on my desk. I don't know that they were going to invent. <laughs> um, you know, so you, it, it is unusual, but they have gone up. And we've got a lot of hype over the last right. three weeks or so about them going down. So now we should move to equal weight, which has definitely seen a lot more inflows. But year to date, uh, the Magnificent Seven has still done better. As a matter of fact, when you look at them, they've averaged, not on a weighted base, but the, you know, when you average them out for just a year to date, pretty early yet, they're up 1.9%. The average issue is down 0.6%. Interesting. Still, so it's still, yeah, there's still, yeah. Yeah. that's a big spread. Least, again, we're still going into 2024. Tomorrow starts earnings season, and I believe earnings will start to take over the market, uh, you know, as the dominant role on there. Uh, but they've still done better. So if you went into yeah. that uh, idea of let's go to the equal weighting, let's do this, you know, the growth value switch over, uh, the opening week and a half hasn't helped you too much. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit then about some of the other industries that are not expected to do well. And I know bank earnings are going to start off. So do you have yeah. any preview of bank earnings? Like, yeah. are they going to be any surprises or how's the, well, how's the revenue I, supposed to look? We need to, when you get the bank and you, and you see the uh, top line there and you see everything that, that's put there at this point in time, you're going to have to read to a lot of footnotes. Uh, a city and bank, and bank of America has already put out notices of billion dollar charges, which some may take on the headline, some may not. So you really need right. to look into to the banks. Uh, overall, financials are expected to be up 20% uh, from last quarter. Great number, but they're still down 15% year over year. You know, which way do you want to talk? You know, uh, so you've right. really got to look through that. <clears throat> What's key to the uh, financials, at least what I'm going to be looking at, is yeah. in their reserves. What's their what's their belief of the economy and what's going forward? That helps me with everyone, not just the banks. <clears throat> OK, I mean, obviously, for the banks, we're still going to look at underwriting and, and uh, M&A, which is picked up, you know, do the bond issuances right. pick up for them. But they have reserves that they have to put away for bad loans and stuff. And they measure that. Credit cards, are they starting to see and do they anticipate? And they're going to quantify it. So I'm going to have an amount there. How much for credit card losses? How much for auto loan losses, which is now a much larger concern uh, for that because they've gone out in duration so much. Additionally, right. all commercial, all commercials, uh, real estate that they're going there, as, as well as a breakdown of mortgages. You know, how much new are you putting? How profitable is? How much is the services? So the financials really are going to tell us a much bigger picture uh, for the economy than that. And and those are the items that we're going to be looking at, their reserves, what they think it is based on what they have to write off. You know, what are they right. seeing in their charges? What are the delinquencies? I mean, there's indices that do that. There's reporting agencies. But these people have to go through them and put their money where their mouth is, and they have to justify it. So when somebody's putting down money, you look to see what their bet is. And you're going to tell us if you see anybody else that looks like they're in danger of going under a la last year's March implosions, right? I, I wish I would have called that. I mean, that, that, you know, the uh, First Republic was a tragedy. I mean, that was a, a nice company, editorial, obviously. Uh, but yes, uh, yeah. that was, but those those were all, the three of them were all banking uh, issues. I mean, banking issues that they should have done right. They did not match up, not just risk and reward, but their time period. They, same mistake could have been made a hundred years ago. It was not something yeah. new. It wasn't a, right. uh, a, a thing that I, on, on something or, or a derivative or something that I could hardly understand anymore. You know, that's four derivatives away, like we had in housing. Uh, right. These were, these were banking the, the mistakes. Uh, and, and we came through it very nicely. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, the mechanics of it, how, how they uh, alleviated with J.P. Morgan buying could have been improved, but they got involved in politics and that slowed it down a little. Uh, yeah. but, but yes, definitely. Uh, I, 
again, tomorrow would be one indication of how banks go look going forward, but their margins are going to be squeezed. And we also think if we're staying on financials that their uh, buybacks are going to be reduced. Uh, it, it, the Fed That's an important how much thing. they could pay out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it comes between buybacks and uh, dividends. Dividends. Dividends win out every single day. Every buybacks, I can, cut, I can cut up and down every day of the week I want. If I give you a dividend, uh, I better give it next quarter. It's in my flow charts. It's in my, the same way rent and salary is going out. And if for some yeah. reason I cut that, it's not going to be a stock. It's a bad sign. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we think the uh, support from that might be uh, a little bit weaker this year. Well, how about in general? Because it seems like uh, Apple and a lot of the Magnificent Seven, at least Microsoft, was kind of leading the buyback charge. Are we still, like, was last year as strong in buybacks as 2022? Are we expecting 2024 no, to be? Uh, okay. Basically, uh, if you've got decent, strong cash flow, and these top companies do, most of them, uh -huh. uh, they're doing a lot, a lot more than buybacks. We are still top heavy. Uh, with all the 50%, the top uh, 20 issues, a little bit uh, over 50% of all buybacks are done by 20 companies. And, and obviously, Apple, uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft, these are the leading ones because they have the cash flow. They have the ability to do it. Uh, as far as this year goes, no, we're looking for, we don't have the full fourth quarter yet, obviously. But we're looking for that $780 billion for this year for buybacks. Okay, that's down significantly from about 920 last year. Going forward, uh, we should get a an uptick a little because prices have gone up. Uh, so maybe yeah. 840 billion. But one of the telltale items here is that buybacks break into two components. One is that companies buy back shares to use for options. So if you're the company, I have an option. Uh, for thirty dollars, you go out and buy the share for fifty. I give you thirty. So for twenty dollars, you're able to negate the option on there. You don't have to worry about diluting and going your earnings. And companies typically do that through even recessions. Uh, COVID right. was different because companies were totally shut down. I mean, you know, departments right. were not right. even open. Uh, but they typically always do that. So the big item is what's called discretionary. That's why you, you, the company, goes in, you buy it for fifty dollars. Okay, you get nothing back, but you reduce your share count by one. So when I take the net income divided by fewer shares, EPS go up. Uh, institutions love that. The core, it, it does several things. One, it gives you an immediate support for your stock. There's more buying. Doesn't mean your stock's worth more. It's a better buy, but there's more buying. I have four people bidding on my house. I'm getting more than three. Didn't change right. my house. Uh, so it does that. And if I do enough of them this quarter, my EPS goes up. It means my PE is low. All the technicians are now looking at me. Uh, exactly. So, the, so uh, the, the buybacks are very important in, in, in this uh, case. And since prices are generally up after that nice fourth quarter, I'm getting less shares for, for mine. So it's less of an impact. So there's less of an impact uh, on the share count, so the EPS aren't going up as much. About a year, uh, fourth quarter, third quarter of last year, 2023, 21% of the companies in the S&P 500, one in five, increased their EPS by at least 4% through share count reduction. That means their cash flow numbers, nothing changed. The net income was the same, but when I divide it by shares, I got at least 4%. This year, it was like 12.2%, 12.3%. So significantly less, still still counts for something, but a lot of them have gone out. A lot of companies have pulled back on buybacks because they're not sure of their discretionary spending, you know, where they're going. When we get more faith and competency in the economy, they'll move. Uh, and yeah. that's why you see buybacks, you know, the amount of them go up and down. They're very volatile. A dividend typically yeah. only goes up. Uh, and by the way, February is the busiest month for dividends. Uh, Company is done with its fiscal, its annual is going out. They're uh, planning a shareholder meeting. No better time to increase the dividend than before you meet the owners. Uh, so February yes. is a very big time for uh, dividend increases. Uh, cuts in well, dividends goes in, uh, go whenever I, they announce. Yeah. I, 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 um, I'm very interested because 
you know, last year we had record buybacks and we had a really strong year in, uh, on Wall Street. 2019, we had great buybacks, a strong year, 2021. So do you see that maybe even this, you know, you've already said maybe four to six percent gains on the S&P. Um, not that's not total return. That's just the return. Right. Um, so maybe that's also one of those factors that pulls the slows the econ slows the you know the market gains down a little bit, as if the buybacks are a little reduced. Do you see yeah. a strong correlation between those two? I saw a stronger correlations historically than I do now. The reason being is other items we had, for example. After COVID, government spending and and transfer yeah. of wealth and all those those were a lot more important. Uh, the the difficulties we had with supply, you know, not just supply and demand, but actually logistics and being able to get things. All these things took a higher priority short term. Yeah. Uh, buybacks yeah. are getting back there, uh, but I think expenditures, uh, both by the government and mm. consumers, will be more important this year. Once we get past the election and past that, then it could be a lot more. You also know a lot more. You know uh, who's going to be in office, what the numbers are, what policies they'll be fo following. And again, the executive branch can do a lot just with a pen, and so can legislation. Uh, they don't always have yeah. to agree. So that's the real expenditure. So again, you, you give a corporate plan on what's going to happen. Uh, they'll find a way around to do stuff. Okay, we have to pull back on this and add to that. We have to change supply, yeah. whatever it might be, depending on tariffs, as an example. But yeah. you tell them, I've got 10 branches on that uh, on that tree. They can't do anything. So so we need more information in there. And as we get that, good or bad, whatever it's going to practice, I think buybacks will come back to uh, more of a dominant role in the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Again, money comes in, it buys the shares. I'm supporting the stock even if it's going down. Yeah. Now, it's interesting because, you know, we've been talking a little bit about banking and these other things, and also the uh, adeptness and experience of corporate C-suite to say, okay, I know now what I'm dealing with in, in Washington, I'll adjust this and that. But we have persistent problems that are um, having difficulty finding solutions <laughs> for. We were just talking about the vacancy rates in wow. commercial real estate. So let's let's get throw out those numbers that you were talking to me about. And then is that an area that we need to be very concerned about? I see that in the financial stability report, it's um, you know, it's one of the areas that a lot of the CEOs in America are the most concerned about. Yeah, uh, real estate is definitely a major area of concern. And it breaks down to different components as compared to if you're looking at a, a REIT, uh, uh, a mall yeah. in your local area. I'm looking downtown, I mean, office space in a major city as compared to uh, residential uh, housing, okay, whether they be exactly. apartment houses, multi dwelling, or single family. So, yeah, real estate has a difficulty now. Uh, we'll take the commercial part first. Uh, there's a recent report uh, out by Moody's Analytics uh, that uh, they believe. 2023 was an all-time vacancy rate high of that 19.6 percent. Only goes back to 1979, but that's funny for me. 19.6 uh, percent, uh, and 2022 was 18.8. And they cited that it's not just the work from home, which was accelerated by COVID, of course, uh, but also right. that we've overbuilt. Uh, you know, oh, it's, interesting. It takes years and years to to do buildings and you've got to get permits, especially in cities, you've got to go through all kinds of, uh, of, of tests and, and, and registrations and hearings. So it takes years. So we still have stuff coming onto the markets. Uh, yeah. So that, that's an important item. And then most buildings are financed. It's not that you go out and you pay for it. Leverage is a major part of real estate. You know, you nobody is putting down 20% the way you might have to a minimum do in a house. You know, this is right. leverage, and when rates go up, as they have, yes, they've come down somewhat, but they are still historically high. The amount of money over the next five years that is going to be coming due and has to be refinanced is putting pressure on a lot of these uh, 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 REITs, you know, and especially in the cities. Uh, so they need yeah. the money. Do I sell the property at a depressed value? Do I pay the higher interest rate? Where do I get it? You know, how, if I'm 
financing most of it, the bank's not going to be lending me more without some more assets. Uh, right. And that could be, you know, self-fulfilling on the way down. Uh, if you Yeah. And, it, and your, your revenue projections are shot. If you've been, uh, you know, if you have a 19.6% vacancy right. rate, I mean, and what about the, you know, a lot of people have been saying, oh, well, we'll just transfer it into housing, but we've seen a lot of issues with that idea too. So do you want to talk a little bit more also, I mean, housing REITs, I, I, I know are not in uh, a trouble like the commercial real estate, but it's interesting because I'm in Santa Monica and there's a lot of new housing built, a lot of new apartments, and a lot of them are vacant because the cost of rent is so high and them, none of them want to drop it. Hey, rent has been starting to come down, uh, okay, but it's still very, very high, uh, especially in the major cities. New York is astronomical. Uh, and San Francisco, I, Los Angeles. Oh, right. And that's with exits, you know, for uh, yeah. people leaving on that. But yes, uh, the, the multi-dwellings, if you want to go on to those first, have the same kind of problems. So they have a little bit more of advantage because they can usually attract uh, a little bit older of a crowd. Uh, they may be married, they may, they may have moved out of the cities, they have a child or not, uh, but yeah. two wage earners. Okay, so that's going to help you, even if those wage earners aren't making enough individually they're combined and they're in one unit so that's a little bit better and you have the house or, or, or uh if it's purchased or the uh, apartment as a uh, as collateral to some degree because again you have to put so much in to begin with in order to get it uh so yeah. so but we do see pressures on those but not as bad as the the cities you know with, with uh uh the the offices as far as homes go uh it's a supply and demand situation. Uh, the, the, the numbers for the housing has been, have been going down, residentials, and then you can go to the public companies for those, you know, the Hortons, the Menards, and all those, uh, the KDs. Yeah. Uh, and their numbers are going down, but the prices of the house is going up. And that is a supply demand situation. People who have housing yeah. are not selling them. They may have a no mortgage, a 3% mortgage if they did it a year and a half ago. And now, gee, I can get it for under seven. Well, you know, as compared right. to over seven, you know, it, it hurts, you know, I'm, so I'm going to sell yeah. my place, buy a small place and have a bigger mortgage. Um, right. That doesn't work. It's frozen that, the market, well. yeah. Yeah, so, so you get uh, not as bad as it was before. Again, interest rates have gone down. But the supply demand is out of whack and we are getting too much demand for the supply. And again, it's not that demand is historically high. It's not if that supply right. is low and that's the rules no matter where you go, supply and demand. So, yeah, so th there's a concern there, but there's still value in the house because if you have to turn it over, you can. You may have a problem where you're going, but on aggregate, you know, it helps the building trade on there. Uh, the, the cities, you know, especially the B's and C's, in other words, the non-A buildings, you know, the big conglomerate, the new buildings that have been redone, have electric and everything, they're in better shape because they usually have longer leases. So, yes, right. uh, you have empty seats there, but you're still paying the rent. You're a large corporation or something. Uh, the lower down you go, they get turned over. I mean, look what happened to WeWorks. Yeah, exactly. You know, now, Let's look a little bit at malls because um, when I go look at the malls in uh, our area here in Los Angeles, there's a boatload of vacancies there too. Yeah, we, we see that nationally on there. Um, the idea of the anchor store doesn't, first of all, really hold up anymore. It used to be, gee, I, I have a J.C. Penney's, I have a Macy's, I have a Neiman Marcus. I mean, in right. New York right here, we, we had a we have Hudson Yards, the new huge development uh, still yeah. being built. Even Marcus had the, the top four and a half. It was enormous. They stayed a couple right. of months and they left. No. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to, 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 to pin on them. They decided that it was not worth staying there to, for the duration and stuff. But I'm just saying it's not, it's not the hubs it used to be. Again, you have right. Macy's there. You were able to do it because that was everything. We now have significantly more online so you don't get the, the hub base you also now get what's starting to help but it hasn't picked up as much as it was hoped for over the last seven eight years and and definitely since post-covid 
is the multi-use. Uh, all of a sudden you have a gym there, you have a, yeah. a, a medical in there, you have yeah. residential. I build a, a multi-dwelling, you know, unit, two, three stories high, so it's not out of whack with, with variants. Um, right. And people live there and they go through yeah. that. Uh, that has added to it. However, it hasn't made up for the stores that are closed. Those are small yeah. stores, typically. Uh, and you know, the kiosks are there, which you also go, but yes, we're seeing that nationally, uh, all over, even in the cities, you know, we'll go down to the, the vertical malls and the, the ones at the, uh, the trade center area, you know, so yeah. those are, those are also, and you see it on the streets when you walk through the cities, we're not even talking about, cause we don't really get the numbers on oh, really definitely. small towns, you know, you have a town yeah. of 5,000 people or something and there's eight stores. Now there's seven. Well, excuse me, that's one seventh of my stores are, are done. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, when we're walking in Manhattan or Santa Monica or San Francisco, you're seeing a lot of boarded up places as well yeah. on the streets, not just even the malls. Yeah. Okay, so I, I know that my time with you is precious and limited, but you have two young adult children, or I guess we have to call them adults now. And um, what is your advice to them? I mean, if, assuming they still listen to you, um, what is your advice to them on how to, you know, really kind of, you know, I mean, do you tell them buy and hold? Do you tell them diversify? Do you tell them rebalance? What is it that you like to impart to them? Now I tell them before I did, because they wouldn't listen. However, the lesson during COVID for the kids, my daughter is 29 <laughs> and my son is 27 and they may have yeah. been you saying this. During COVID, they went on like everyone else did and robbed, you know, different ways and bought stocks. It was on the newspaper, it's going up, not the newspaper, excuse me, God forbid. Right. Uh, it, it was on the web, buy this, buy that, okay? And right. it kept going up because more money comes in. It's like the buy that money comes in, it goes up. Doesn't mean it's right. better. Uh, and uh, shock and dismay, they didn't realize what goes up could go down. Uh, my uh -huh. daughter, I, when I, you know, my daughter had over 40 stocks. I'm looking through, I, I don't know these companies. I'm in the business 47 years. I don't even know what, you know, she yeah. didn't know it, you know. So these kids have yeah. started to, to, to buy stocks and at least for them, and this has happened for a lot of people because I've spoken to other Beam parents. stock phenomenon. They, yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> But the stocks went down. It is a great lesson. Yeah. Did they lose a couple of thousand dollars? Yes, they did not lose the rent money. They did not lose the, uh, I'm going to retire money. I'm saving for my yeah. house. I need it for medical. Right. They learned the lesson, what goes up goes down. The risk reward scenario. Uh, and that's an right. important lesson for kids to learn. And I believe Absolutely. kids, you know, the 20s, and they are definitely going forward. They are trading. They're used to it. They see it. Yeah. It's easy. They get nice emojis when they're up. <laughs> Uh, but yep. they are the traders of tomorrow. Uh, it's not yeah. waiting till you're 30 something to start trading to put something in. They are going from the beginning. When they go for a job, they get to pick, you know, where's my money going for my 401k? You know? Yeah. Uh, and they're doing it. Made right. And they're used to it and they're getting information. Are they getting proper information? I don't believe so. They don't do the research. Right. Don't do but guess what? They're in their 20s. They are going to continue to be trading. For that reason, I look 10 years down the road, 20 years down when they start getting more money and better at investing, they are going to be the, the big movers in the market. When I started, it was all those men smoking cigars and having scotches at the pension club. You yeah, know? well, you couldn't do anything online. Sorry to date you a little bit, right? You had to, no, you couldn't it, do it, it yourself. It, it took me a <laughs> week to, to open up my first brokerage account. I had that all this kind of, Paperwork. I can open it up and lose every penny I have, you know, before we wrap this up. 30 minutes. I'm saying the, but, the, but the kids now have more. So my advice yeah. to them is be to research, get that idea. Hopefully you have an idea of risk or what goes up, goes down. But you are also, you have the one thing that, for example, I don't, and, and you have, uh, you, you have some, but I have less, you know, of time, you know, you're going to yeah. see bull markets and bear markets. You're going to see it go up and down decide what your objective is and how you want to do. I want to play short term. Okay, I'm going. This thing is in the paper. It's every day. I shouldn't say paper. It's on the web every day. It's hype. I'm going in. I'm going to make two, five percent of my money and get out. No, this is I want to do investing. I like this business. I think it's going. It looks right. like a good management company. So yes, it may be down at the end of the year, but I feel comfortable five years down the road. 
Uh, and something that I don't think many kids are going to go is dividends. Uh, dividends, mm. uh, short term, they get in your way. Long term, it makes a big difference. Long term, dividends account right. for 38% of your return. So if you're looking at your retirement account, your 401 or something, you know, dividends reinvested make a big difference. Uh, it's like watching paint drop, dry, you know, 2%. Right. You want, I want to make 2% on my next trade. Uh, so I would tell them to look at that, but definitely to start researching. And they, they are going to be active investment traders. Yeah. And, you know, when, like when we talk about dividends versus growth and that sort of thing, I mean, even just diversifying, like if you're doing your 401k, oftentimes they do have, hey, why don't, are you interested in a large growth or a large uh, value? Right. You know, so diversifying. Also, I think before we wrap up, you know, when you see something like the Magnificent Seven doing so well, and let's say now, you know, it started out being 10% of your portfolio and now it's 30%. Would you trim back, right? You don't have to like try to trade your 401k, but what about having a review right. where you do, yeah. you know, be, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that, that is important. Uh, getting a, a, a normal annual review, a lot of people don't do it. Uh, I mean, every time the market hits a certain level, when it's going to hit 5,000, people are going to say, what does that mean for the S&P? When we hit the, 30, the 38, 39, 40,000 on the Dow, what does that mean? You know, and, right. and, and I would say that it's a good time to look at your portfolio and to see what's happening as compared to yeah. doing a day trading and stuff. You know, is, is it still on track for what I want? I want to buy this. I want to retire. I want to, uh, I need money for college. You know, this is my duration. Right. I, you know, as compared to the general market, I have eight years. I have to start to take this money down and to, Put that in focus of what is, and as far as the numbers, that, for example, you use, yes, the market has increased these stocks enormously. Now it's 30%. Well, do I want to have 30% in this stock today? Not yesterday, but today. Yes, it made a nice return for me, but that's yesterday. I can't live on yesterday's numbers. I either made it or I didn't. So do you want to reallocate and say, you know, I don't want more than 15% or I feel comfortable with so much on this company? Uh, yeah. So so the market will change just as it did in 2022, took them all down. That 10% was now 6%. You know, do you want to increase on that? So reviewing and having that, you know, getting information uh, is important uh, and uh, to everyone and, and reviewing yeah. what you're holding. Okay. So I'm just going to give a quick review for those of you that need to write it down. He's saying... In his crystal ball, and of course, things can change, 4 to 6% perhaps this year. With, that's not including dividends. That could bump it up, what, another point and a half? One and a half percent for the, for the now, S&P 500. Now, Otherwise, the dividends are higher. Seven. Yeah. So the Magnificent Seven was the major driver of last year, but it was the major problem in 2022. So give us those numbers yeah, yeah. just so people understand just why it's so important to look at your portfolio annually, you know, rather than just, I mean, now, you know, things are kind of leveling out, but um, go ahead and give us the numbers on Magnificent oh, 7 2022. Well, uh, the Magnificent 7 actually underperformed when you look at it. For example, the S&P 500 over those two years is just about a break even, a 0.3% over two years. If you would have bought yeah. a treasury two-year note, it was 0.7, you wouldn't get on better. Uh, the Magnificent 7, uh, have not done that much better. Has, has NVIDIA done better? Yes, but like Tesla yeah. is still in the red over those two years. So they have not added. As a matter of fact, over those two years, Tesla took the most away from the S&P 500 as compared to in 2023, uh, it was one of the magnificent seven and added among the most. So again, yeah. the market reprices for you, even if you don't want to. So you have to keep track of what it has, but you don't need to do it day to day. Uh, and right. if you can't do it yourself, you need a trusted advisor, not everyone. As my daughter was telling me when it was going up, this is easy. I can't believe you call this work, you know, uh, to pick stocks <laughs> and indexes. You need to find I'm sure she doesn't say that anymore. <laughs> no, but, but, she has, but she's, she's dealing on that. Uh, so, yeah. so you really need to find somebody, an advisor or, or something to read, yeah. publication that gives you an idea and to keep your own eyes on your objective, uh, what you want. This is what I want. This is, you know, when I need money. This is how much I will risk. 
You know, we all yeah. want to gain when the market goes up, but guess what? Stocks go down. And if you can't live through that, you've got to sell it. And that's gone. And that means that's end of game for that investment. So you really yeah. need to know yourself what you're willing to risk and not risk. Uh, and then get you get an advisor because they, they put you in. If you describe what you want to do, I want income. I can find your stocks. You want growth. You want to take so much chance. Find you can find things for you. You know, all advice. I don't mean my, my, myself necessarily, but the, you need to know yourself. You have to look inside because you are the one who has to live with the gain or the loss. I feel bad if you lost money. You're going to feel worse. Yeah, you got to be the boss of your money. Okay, that's a good final word. But if you want mm -hmm. another like, um, you know, words of wisdom from Howard Silverblatt before we'd sign off. Feel free. Uh, Cuban bonds, if we ever get back to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> not, not, that's an old joke. Um, uh, oh. <laughs> no, 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 know your tolerance, because people react during different times differently. Know your tolerance, your liquidity, and what you have. Uh, there are times you know, when the market is going down, maybe you should buy. And there are times during the same going down, guess what, get off because the ship is going down. You have to know yourself, your own tolerance, what you're willing to risk and not. And the implication for that, if I lose this money, I'm putting off buying a house for two years. My kid's gonna have three years of college instead of four. Uh, so again, look inward first before you look outward to say, how does my portfolio get managed? Uh, and specifically what I buy. Sounds good. So again, this was Howard Silverblatt. He is the senior index analyst of the S&P 500, uh, the S&P Dow Jones Industries, Indices. Now, Howard, how many years you've been doing this? God help us. I'm on my 47th year. Okay, so he knows what he's doing. Seven. Yay. Yeah, you started- on probation. 1977. <laughs> In May of 77, just to give it give you, there were two issues that broke 100 that month. Oh. One oh, was wow. the S&P 500. Yeah. Okay. The other one was Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. I could have bought a share of Berkshire Hathaway for $100, several shares a week with my paycheck. That share oh, wow. is over half a million dollars now. Uh, boy, oh, boy. Plus share. Uh, my paycheck hasn't kept up to a couple of shares a week for half a million. But uh, yeah. yeah, so time does uh, do things. And, and as I said, back then it took me a week to open up a brokerage account. But uh, if I had to say just out of memory, the, the biggest change between 77 and today is communication. We are doing this right here. I used to get information yeah. from, a, from a, a Reuters system, cut a story, and you'd read it and see if you have something material and where it would go. Um, yeah. Now something happens. I'm on my cell phone in two seconds. I got live feeds from it. It may be one-sided or not, but communications, which we would have called technology before, but that is, I think, the, the greatest change that uh, over that time period, uh, not that I can open up a spreadsheet that used to take me a week and a half to get, <laughs> to, to do manually, but the communications yeah. and the speed of everything. Yeah, it's incredible. I thank you so much, Howard. I'm gonna stop us there. Okay. Hang on one sec.